All right, jump in today's lesson. Last, co last uh, two messages were on prayer, and today I want to kind of jump out of that, but they certainly are related. And I'm going to talk about first fruits today. But primarily I'm going to start about giving and then uh, jump into first fruits because that's largely a concept that's not understood in the church as a whole. Oftentimes when it's taught, if first fruits is even mentioned at all in a church setting, they usually say, pay your tithe first before anything else, and that's your first fruits. Well, that's a good habit to do, but biblically that's not first fruits. First fruits is clearly something other than that that we're going to look at today. So I've entitled the message, First Things First, and I want to give you a little history about uh, this journey into first fruits. It really started for me probably around 2010, and there were some folks that we invited in that we began to uh, listen to and, and, and teach about finances and, and God's understanding of finances and how we get a hold of that and live and give. And they begin to introduce this understanding of biblical first fruits. So that I was probably around 2010 that I first heard it. And then uh, there were other people that, that, again, taught on it. I, I personally began to practice first fruits probably not long after that. But it wasn't until 2015 that I had my first public sermon on first fruits. And I don't know how well it went, but uh, that's when I started but I will note one thing that happened after I preached it publicly, something changed. You see, seven years prior to that, when we moved into this building, we struggled financially as a church. Some weeks we didn't know whether or not uh, we were going to make it. There were periods of times where I didn't get paid for a month and a half because we just didn't have it. And we were living at that level, trying to do what we knew, even tithing. I stopped tithing. We tithe as the church. We believe it's a, a principle that works personally. It also works as an organization. I even stopped tithing. It got so tight. And we got a new elder in, and we began to discuss the financial situation. He said, are we tithing? And I, I said, well, we just stopped a month or two ago. And he looked at me, and he said, why are you doing that? So that's the, that's the, the, that's the beauty of bringing new people in. They said, we're going to start tithing. And I remember carrying that next check. I actually carried it up to the, the, the offices where we, where we tithe. And, and I remember the Lord speaking to me along the way. He said, that check in your hand, now you have leverage with me. He said, you didn't have leverage before. You lost it, but now you have leverage with me. That's what he spoke. And so I, I, I shared that sermon publicly, and that 2015, everything changed after that. It's never been the same. We came out that 2015 in the black, and we've been climbing ever since with, with generosity and plenty. And I'm convinced, without a shadow of a doubt, it's because I, I personally started practicing. I began to teach you how to practice, and God blessed you. And as a result of that, this place is blessed. And so I want to bring another message uh, for you today in that regard. Again, this is just the tip of the iceberg of what could be shared. There's really two primary people that uh, helped me understand this from the Word of God. One is Tony Fitzgerald, and the other is um, Robert Henderson. And we've had them both here to minister. And Robert wrote a book called The Caused Blessing. The Caused Blessing. And it's all about first fruits. And he shared with uh, one and I personally that when that was the first book he ever wrote. He, I don't know how many books he's written now. First book he's ever written, wrote, and, he, and God said, if you give all the proceeds from that book outside of your ministry, then I'll bless every other book you write. And he said, that's been today uh, the case. I've never taken any of the money coming from that book, sell of that book, and it's been a bestseller for him. I've never taken any of that money to myself or my ministry. It's all going outside of it. And as a result, God has blessed every other book that he has written. So again, I mentioned that something that's probably new in most of our minds. It's not something that's taught in the church, but it's certainly in the Bible in which we'll dive into today. I've uh, always enjoyed studying about finances and understanding finances and didn't really come with a family that was that, was that financially off, even though I, I would say my dad was generous, but they said that uh, he made the statement in his 20s that he was going to be a millionaire by the end of his life. Well, in his 50s, he went bankrupt, but that didn't stop him. In his 60s, he started a new business, and from 60 to 85, he was way more successful than he was from his 20s to his 50s. 
And so the Lord, you know, has these ways. Sometimes we're just out of our timing, and we get in the Lord's timing, and he redeems things. So let's jump in today, starting with Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 31 through 34. Jesus is concluding after he is writing about how we should view material things. And he talks about, you know, money versus God and, and different things that he, he discusses about how we should look, lay up treasure in heaven and not on earth and so forth. And he concludes that teaching with these words. He says, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. If Jesus were a songwriter, he would have written a song. Be happy. Don't worry. Don't worry. Be happy. Everything's going to be all right, right? That's what he would have written because that's just what he said. But the people of the world don't understand that. They don't understand there's a loving God that takes care of them and watches over them and protects them from the things that can steal from us. They don't understand that, and so they passionately run after, what are we going to eat? What are we going to wear? Where are we going to go? That's the first and foremost in their minds, but not us. We say, no, we're supposed to seek his kingdom first. And his righteousness and all those things that everybody else is panicking and chasing after and stressed after. No, those things are just going to follow in behind us. They're going to follow us around other than us chasing after them. That's the way it should be in the kingdom. And so Jesus was saying that, uh, concluding those remarks. When we talk about giving, I realize there's really three perceptions that people have about giving. And Oftentimes this can happen around the church, and maybe as I identify these three, you'll say, that's me. But I want to take you someplace th this morning in, in uh, introducing these three aspects or perceptions about, about giving. There's a verse in Acts chapter 20, verse 35. It says, remembering the words of Jesus himself when he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And there was a long period of time when I had the wrong perception about that verse. Because I thought it, I was more blessed if I were receiving and not giving. I thought that was the place where I would enjoy the most happiness if somebody was given to me rather than me giving to somebody else. I just had the wrong perception because that's not what that verse says. The verse says that you are more blessed if you're giving than you are receiving. And then suddenly it dawned on me, I realized one day, wait a minute, if I'm giving, that means I have more than enough to give. And I am blessed. If I'm not giving, I don't have more than enough. I'm barely making it, therefore I'm receiving from somebody else. But because I'm able to give, I have more than enough. Yay, I am blessed. And when I changed that perception, then it just changed everything. I was like, yeah, that's right. I agree with God on that one. Now, first of all, I wasn't sure I did agree with him on that statement, but then my perception changed. Well, there's three different perceptions about giving that we have. The first is compulsory giving, not compulsory gambling, but compulsory giving. And if you have this mentality when you give, what you think about is something is being taken from me. If you have an understanding that giving is compulsory, then you will think something is being taken from me. And that's how oftentimes the world views the church. It's all about money. Well, it's not all about money, but they have that perception that it is. They are taking something away from people. And we can develop that kind of mindset or that kind of, of uh, perception if you have that kind of perception, you're like, oh, we're going to some place where they're asking for offering. I think I'll leave my wallet at home. I'll take out my bills so that I won't be compelled to give. Sometimes we think ahead because we have this mentality that giving is compulsory. The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, he says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly, or under compulsion. 
for God loves a cheerful giver. So the Apostle Paul recognized that sometimes people were giving under compulsion. That, that whoever was, was leading was putting you know, pressure on leaders. I, and I have been in some meetings where uh, people have demanded that we give under compulsion, and I didn't like it. In fact, uh, I heard of a church, I don't know, maybe Chris was telling me, this may have happened overseas, that they actually invoiced people for their tithe. <laughs> That's kind of funny. That's out there. That's giving under compulsion. <laughs> The second way that we can perceive giving is responsibility giving, meaning it's my obligation. I'm just responsible to give. Therefore, I'm going to give. It's my, you know, if it gets tough, I just grunt it out, and I'm going to give because that's just my responsibility. That's what God says to give, and so I'm just going to do it that way. It's my duty to give. That can be a level of perception about giving. I'm just going to suffer through this and make it through. I'm responsible in my giving. We can have that attitude about uh, giving and finances. Malachi chapter 3, 9 and 10 says this, You're under a curse, the whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. Wow, that's amazing. But that, those couple of verses start out kind of harsh, don't they? <laughs> You're under a curse. It's like, whoa, that's heavy. Okay, I need to be responsible then to tithe. And we get to the good part at the end, but sometimes it started out so harsh and heavy that we don't lose that perception and we, we, we aren't even able to take in the joy of what he wants to do because it started out so harsh. Well, that's what the people needed to hear, obviously, at that time when he spoke. But we can have this perception that, that we're just responsible to give. The third level of perception is where I want to take you today, and that is faith giving. The difference between faith giving and compulsory giving and responsibility giving is that when you give in faith, you expect something back. Now, that might be a popular thought of you, but that's how I give. I expect when I give in to God that he's going to give something back to me in whatever area I need. I may need extra provision. I may need good health. I may, may need God to, to watch over my cars so they don't wear out sooner than they're supposed to. They, he may watch over my appliances so they don't wear out. He may, he may give me uh, good, solid relationships in my family, but I expect something back when I give in to God. And that's faith giving. You see, compulsory, it's taken from you. Responsibility is I may or may not get something from God. It's kind of open. But when you give in faith, you believe God is going to bring you something back. And that's how we should be giving as God's people. Abraham did that. Even before the law was written, he met a guy named Melchizedek. He was a king. I believe he was Jesus, uh, uh, kind of clothed as a king. And came out after he won a battle. And they had some bread and wine together. They had communion. And after that, Abraham said, I'm going to give you a tenth of all that I gained in the spoils. And so Abraham understood this whole thing. That as he was blessed by Melchizedek, then he gave back. There was an exchange that went on. Jacob understood the same thing. Again, this is before it became law, so to speak, or written from God through Moses. Jacob understood the same thing. He said, God, as you blessed me, I'm going to give you back a tenth. So he understood this whole thing. As God blessed him, then he would give as well. There was an exchange that was happening in, in their lives. And so we recognize that when we give in faith, there's a return that takes place. And if we don't give in faith, there may or may not be a return, or we feel like it's being taken from us. 2 Corinthians 9.10 says this, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Did you hear the progression? God's going to give you something to start with. 
He's going to give you a skill, an ability, something that somebody needs. It's marketable. And as a result, they give you a paycheck at the end of the week, hallelujah, or two weeks, or maybe at the first of the month. And so they give that to you as a result of you contributing to their organization, making it run or making it better. And then as a result, God says in this one, he said he's not only going to give you that skill and ability, but he's going to increase it. You're going to get a raise, or you're going to get a bonus. You're going to get something that you didn't, you didn't think about, surprise money coming in. And then he doesn't stop there. He says he's going to enlarge the harvestness, the, our, our, our righteousness. Isn't that amazing? But that's God. That's what he does. He starts with the small. And if we don't have, uh, have that understanding of faith that we give, then we'll miss all that. And we'll think to ourselves, well, God's just a stingy God, and he didn't want to share it with anybody. No, God's waiting to pour out. But we have to line up with his principles and these facets of how we give and understand it in order for the blessings to come. Now, maybe you can look at your perception of giving. And maybe you say, wow, I think I have a compulsory view of giving. Well, God wants you to move up to faith. Or maybe you have an area of, you just give, you're just responsible to give. That's who you are. Well, God wants you to move up to faith so that he can pour out what he has in mind for you. Number two, giving has different benefits to our lives. Giving has different benefits to our lives. In other words, depending upon what we're giving into, there's different benefits that come back as a result of what we're giving. And I'll explain that in a few moments. I want to read out of 2 Corinthians 9, 12. It says this, So two things, two good things, will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of believers in Jerusalem will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. So one gift produced two results. One gift, a need was met, and second, caused them to thank God for meeting their needs. So two things result out of one gift, and God does that. So he has different uh, aspects that come to us as a result of our giving. Now, essentially, there's three categories of giving in the Bible. There's first fruits, tithes, and offerings. And most of us are familiar with tithes and offerings, and so I'm going to settle a lot of my comments here into uh, first fruits in a few moments. But again, I'm just tipping the iceberg. If it's new to you, you go into our YouTube channel and uh, look up first fruits and see various messages that are related to that to learn more. And you can do a, a biblical study as well. And so we have uh, God saying that as you give, there's different uh, responses back from that giving. Now, the thing that I want to point out is that first fruits, tithes, and offerings are written in the Bible before the law was given. In other words, first fruits happened with Cain and Abel. They brought first fruits. You have uh, Abraham. You have Jacob tithing. You have offerings taking place. That was before the law was given. And then when the law was given in Leviticus, you have spoken about, I want my people to first fruit, tithe, and offering. You have that in Leviticus. And then you have it in Deuteronomy again when a new generation is getting into the promised land. First fruits, tithes, and giving. And then you have it in Nehemiah. When the people came back out of captivity for 70 years, if you read Nehemiah, you'll find that he specifically talks about first fruits, tithes, and offerings. So all through the, the, the Old Testament, you have these three distinct categories, and each one has a different purpose. In the New Testament, first fruits more relates to spiritual blessings than material blessings. Why did God do that? Because the material was established. People understood that. And then he said in the New Testament, now I want you to understand that you can also receive spiritual blessings from first fruits. Tithes, again, is mentioned in the New Testament. Not a lot, but it is mentioned. Why is it not mentioned more? Because people had the understanding of tithing. It was ingrained in them. And so Jesus really didn't need to teach about it a whole lot because they were practicing it. Now, it doesn't mean that they had the greatest attitude. and They probably had more of an obligation or responsibility attitude in their tithing than they did faith. But they still tithe, so it's not taught. 
some people say, well, it's just related to the law back, and, and since we're free from the law, we don't need to tithe. Well, we're not in the order of, Levit of Levi, which was responsible for the law. We're in the order of Melchizedek that says so in Hebrews, and Abraham tithed to Melchizedek, therefore we're in the order of priesthood of Melchizedek, therefore the tithe is still just as real in the New Testament as it is in the Old because of the order that we're in. Did you catch all that? All right, good stuff here, plowing through. And so we need to understand these categories and how they're taught in the Bible and, again, how they benefit us. Let's jump into first fruits, the benefit. First fruits are gifts of honor connected to increase. If you read in the Scripture about uh, the purpose of a first fruit offering, it was the, again, as the name implies, the start, the beginning when harvest came due, this is in nature. You plant a garden, you'll get three tomatoes and four beans and, and five uh, cucumbers. Do first before the rest comes due. That's God shows first fruits in nature. And so he says, I want you, my people, I want you to take that first fruits. And you had a choice at that point. You could either bring it to the priest and ask him to ask God to bless the remainder to come, or you could take that first fruits and put it in the barn in case uh, you had a drought that year, you would still have seed to plant the following year. You had a choice. You could either save it in the barn in case you needed it, or you could take it to God and say, God, I want you to bless that, what is, that which is to come rather than me thinking, oh, no, I might have a famine. I might have, I might have a lack of harvest. I need to save some in order to make sure I have something to plant. You had a choice. And so first fruits, again, is related to it's an honor gift. What did they do? They basically brought their first fruits, which in that time was, was more produce. They brought it to the high priest, and he would receive it. I'm going to read a scripture here in a moment that talks about that, uh, that they would, they would, he would receive their first fruits, and then they would lift it up to the Lord, and they would have a wave offering before God. Hey, God, here's my first fruits. And God would see that, and he would again cause a blessing to fall upon the future to come on that person and on the harvest to come. Let me read out of Deuteronomy 26, just four verses, <clears throat> that uh, talks about this, uh, this practice. Deuteronomy 26. When you have entered the land the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance and have taken possession of it and settled in it, take some of the first fruits of all that, that, that you produce from the soil in the land the Lord your God has given you and put them in a basket and go to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. And say to the priest in the office at that time, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come to the land the Lord God swore to your forefathers to give us. And the priest shall take the basket from your hands and set it down in front of the altar of the Lord your God. So they take the first fruits, again, lift it up to the Lord. It's an honor gift. You're honoring God that He is your sole provision. That's primarily what a first fruits is. It's not a lot of money. It's a small portion compared to what you're going to receive in the future to come. Again, it's the first due. It's your first paycheck. A lady just shared with me after the first service. She said that the first time that she'd heard this teaching, we had Robert Henderson in. He taught on it. That was probably maybe three or four years ago. And she said she understood it, and she began to practice it in her life. And she got to the end of uh, where she was going to retire. This just happened recently. And so she, she retired, this was in January, I believe, and she, uh, she said, now, my next paycheck is going to accumulate some things, maybe it was uh, some PTO or sick time or whatever, but anyhow, it was going to be a larger check at the very end than all the others, and she determined in her heart that she was going to uh, first fruit that, even though she was retiring. And so she did. On Sunday... She, on that Sunday, after she got her check, she first fruited that to three different ministries that she felt like God was asking her to first fruit. That was on Sunday. 
Tuesday, they called her in, and they said, we just want to, um, you know, say goodbye to you. You've been with the company now. I, I was 20-some, I think 26 years. I don't know if I have that right, but a long time. And we just want to appreciate you for all you've done around here and gave her a check for $10,000. Tenfold increase. Wow. So, you know, God just, uh, God's amazing. And it's not all about finances, but the more finances we have, the more we're able to bless others. It's not about how much we can get and what, and what newer car we can drive or what bigger house we can build. No, it's about you, you, know, you, you uh, basically, um, uh, the more that we earn, the more that we give. That's what's happened in my life. I haven't raised my standard of living. I just, the more that I get, the more that I give. And that's what God designed it in being. So tithes then are a, uh, uh, first fruits is an honor gift. Tithes are obedience connected to positioning and protection. When you give a tithe, that's the purpose. That's what you'll get, the reward. Uh, when you honor the Lord, then he gives you increase. When you tithe, he keeps you in the right position and also protects that uh, uh, from the spoils or, or from, the, from the enemy from, from uh, creeping in and getting it. Let me read a scripture out of Malachi. Malachi 3, 10 through 12. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. That's positioning. The tithe keeps us reminded to be in the right position for the pouring out to come. And he says, and I will prevent pests from devouring your crops. And the vines in your field will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Some people say, well, this will only work in an affluent society. I heard a pastor that started a work in Honduras, a very poor nation, and he decided if it's God's principle, it's God's principle. It's going to work in any culture at any time. And so he taught those Honduran people how to tithe. And as a result, they are so blessed when all the other people around them are still in poverty. They have the best buildings on their church. They are doing amazing ministry because God taught them this principle of tithing even in a society of poverty, and it works. And God raised them up to be something they never dreamed of because they honored the Lord and started practicing it, and the rewards came back. That's what happens when you give in faith. Offerings then are really gifts of generosity connected to abundant blessings. When you get to the level of giving offerings, you're blessed. You have overflow. You have more than enough. And so you begin to then share that with, with people and ministries and places that, and, and, and people that you, you didn't before because you didn't have it. And after God begins to bless you because of your obedience through first fruits tithes, then you get to the place of offerings and you begin to give, and that's when generosity starts to flow. Generosity starts to come out of the, the extra that we have. Second Corinthians 9.11 says this, And you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Amazing. You'll be enriched in every way, and you can be generous on every occasion so that your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. So a summary is this. Do you need increase in your life? The increase really comes from first fruits. And as a result of obeying God, if you're saying, I'm satisfied, I don't need increase, then don't first fruit. And you'll stay the same. You can diligent, you can, you know, tithe. That's a great thing to do to protect that which you have. And if you have a little extra, you give an offering, but you say, I like to increase, then consider first fruits and see what happens. I know it's worked in my life and many others' life. It works, it, it's taught in the scripture as that. First fruits is the honor gift. You honor the Lord, and as a result, he then brings the increase. Why is that? Well, number three, first fruits cause God 
to own your harvest. This is powerful. First fruits causes God to own your harvest. Let me read the verse out of Ezekiel 44:30. The first of all the first fruits of every kind and every contribution of every kind you shall also give to the priest the first of your dough to cause a blessing to rest on your house. That's what it says. To cause a blessing to rest on your house. So apparently what happens is that when you bring a first fruits offering and you honor the Lord with it, that he makes a decision he's going to get involved in your harvest. He says, your harvest has now become my harvest. As a result of your first fruits, therefore, I'm going to watch over and guide you and lead you and bring you increase because you have chosen to honor me in the beginning, in the front end of this. You've chosen to honor me, and as a result, then I'm going to get involved. I'm going to own your harvest just like it was mine. I'm going to cause a blessing. He says to come upon or to rest Upon Rest means to stay, not to leave suddenly or to, you know, whoo, it's gone. No, he says, I want to I cause this to come upon your house. And even house can be interpreted as your lineage. In other words, your, your children will be blessed, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, all of it as a result of us being obedient. And God says, therefore, I'm going to own this with you, and then we're going to see the results come because you know that I'm involved. Romans eleven sixteen talks about dough as well. It says, if the first part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. And so God gives the picture here that if you have a loaf of bread and you, you take a pinch off the loaf of bread and you lift that up to God and say, God, thank you for giving me bread today. I honor you with this bread, and I just want to recognize that all that I have is yours, and I just give this back as an honor offering to you. God says, therefore, I take the remainder of the loaf, and it's holy too, not just the part. It's set apart too, not just the part that you broke off and lifted up to me. In the same way, the roots. He said, if the roots are holy, then the rest of the tree is holy as well as you lift it up to me. And so God says, I'm going to, uh, you, you take a small portion in the front end and bring it before me, then I'm going to own it all with you. And we're going to journey through this whole thing together. So God's blessing stays on your lineage. And then the second thing God does is that God stands guard to fend off predators. This is amazing news. God stands guard to fend off predators because he owns it with you. He says, what's yours is mine and what's mine is yours. That's the way it's always been, right? Jeremiah 2, 2 and 3 says, Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. I will remember the devotion of your, I remember the devotion of your youth and how as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness, though a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest, and all who devoured her were held guilty, and disaster overtook them. There it is. God said, Israel, you're following me, you're my bride, and therefore anybody that comes against me in this journey from Egypt to the promised land, I am against them. They are predators against them. I'm going to take them out. You are going to Go into the promised land just like I prophesied that you will. And God saw to it that they got there. And anybody that rose up against them, he said, no, you're not going to overtake them because they are my first fruits in the promised land. Number four, preaching or practicing first fruits is another opportunity to exercise faith and receive greater blessing. I don't really consider first fruits as necessarily if you don't practice a lack of obedience unless God tells you to and you're not doing it that's lack of obedience I consider it more as an opportunity for you to receive God's increase so it's not necessarily that you're disobeying God if you <clears throat> you don't choose to practice first fruits <laughs> 
I grabbed my water there. <clears throat> no, we're not going to have the spell that we had last week. So cancel that. But I do believe it's another opportunity for you to receive the increased blessing of God in whatever area that you would decide to first fruit. And so when you when you give a first fruit, you um, you need to label what it's for. You don't just give generally. You label for what it's for. You like put an earmark on it. And that's the way I've given my first fruits in the, in the, uh, in the past, that I've actually given them for a particular purpose. Sometimes I've given it to a person. Other times I've given it to a fund. We have a first fruits fund here at Crossroads that we've set up that a lot of people, uh, part of our body, give into. But it can be given to a person rather than just a fund. What do we do with that? We actually bless people outside of Crossroads. We give into 16 different ministries of people that were in need of situations that we heard about. And we just had that available to give. And it's been, a, it's been a lot of fun to give, and it's been a huge blessing for them on the other side that had a need, and they received that and gave thanks to God. So that's kind of what, uh, what we do. Uh, this year, I gave two different uh, uh, first fruits, and um, uh, one, I, I, right before vacation, um, God impressed me I needed to give a first fruit. And I, I never really had this happen before, but he was like, you need to do this before vacation. I was like, yes, Lord. So I, I, I was giving it to an individual, and it was for a particular purpose. So I called the person in, and they understood what was going on, and, and uh, I gave, and, and he prayed over me and blessed me. And what I didn't know was that part of what I was believing for started happening that afternoon. And finished up on Tuesday a portion of what I was believing and praying for, for that situation. It actually started that afternoon. And I believe that God showed me that he was desiring me because he wanted to cause this situation to begin to work itself out for good. That he actually placed on me, get your first fruits up to me so that I can jump in here and start working in a way that you want me to work and I want to work. But I need this first fruits in order to cause this to take place. See, that's different from how we think about God. And it might not happen to you, but I'm just sharing out of personal experience of that. And so first fruits is, is exciting uh, for me to participate in and to um, and to give, I'm I'm going to share one other thing yet. And um, I think my friend John that lives in another state, he practiced first fruits. Um, he, I said, John, give me a testimony. Actually, he volunteered, and he said, uh, I got it. I got I got it this morning. Four pages. <laughs> I'm not going to read four pages to you, but just a portion. And uh, John said he heard about First Fruits in 2017. And I'll just highlight a couple of things. He said um, uh, he and his wife decided to give to an overseas missionaries group. And he said, right after that, I felt like something just clicked inside of faith for sowing for First Fruits for change. He said, I wasn't sure what change would involve. But I was open to whatever that meant. There's one part that I knew, believing specifically for a pay change, I was specifically believing for a certain value. And he said, so the first Sunday of December of 2017, I sowed a specific amount of first fruits to, of, of the value that I believed that God wanted to increase. He says, two days later, a family member who had a legal injury case tied up for months with zero progress, suddenly gets a call, and the opposition called and agreed that they would not contest it and pay the full payment out. Two weeks later, I'm on a project at work, having worked on it for years, instantly gets a huge change and canceled, and, is a, and the project is canceled, and I'm out of a job. But he said, earlier that day, I had a feeling that was going to happen. And so I applied for a job that day. And that evening, that company that I reached out to uh, 
called me and arranged an interview. And they interviewed me in December holidays and offered me a job that I would start in January. And the salary for the new job was also uh, the work from, the salary from the new job was exactly the value that had sown approximately six weeks earlier. And he said, I also got to work from home when nobody was working from home. And then it became popular, compulsory, obviously, to work from home. But he said, I was already doing it. And then his family kind of went into a deep dive. A lot of health issues that were surrounding the family. But God kept prospering him through different jobs. Again, he would give first fruits. God kept prospering him. And as a result, he said, I was adequately able to take care of my family and other families around me related to me that needed help as well. And long story short, I think it's at the end of four pages, he said, from when I started in, 270, in, in 2017 to where I'm at right now, he said, I've had a 250% increase in salary. So, you know, the evidence kind of speaks for itself. And sometimes we, uh, we wonder, wow, it's just a new thing, want more money. Man, if you're thinking that, you know what? You're thinking that, don't participate. Because I don't want to bring you into something that you're going to be disappointed about. It has to be entered by faith. First fruits enters by faith. Tithing is entered by faith. Offerings are entered by faith. And if we don't enter by faith and keep faith as the central thing, you don't give to church. You give to Jesus at church. And if you don't keep that focus, then it will just ruin you. Because you don't like what the church is doing because your tithe is there. But your tithe doesn't go to the church. It goes at the church, but it goes to Jesus. And so some of these things, our perceptions get all whacked out in the midst of, of life and things. And we need to come to the place of just getting them straightened out again. And then when we get under the flow of the principles of how God designed it, we'll see things happen in our lives and around us that we never dreamed of. And God says, yeah, I planned it that way, but you've got to start practicing things the way I've laid it out. First fruits, tithes, and offerings. And again, I'm very passionate about this. Don't let my passion overtake you if you're still, uh, if, if you're still reserved about it. That's not, what, that's not what I mean to do. It's an opportunity for you just to honor God again and to say, you know what? I'm ready for increase. And it may not be a financial increase, it may be a customer increase, it may be a, a health increase, it may be a relationship increase. I don't know. God works in all, He's a holistic God. He's just, just not, he's, just, he's not just after giving us more money. Because if, he, if, he, if, if that were the case, and we're not, we're not in character to understand who's given it to us and how to use it, then we'll ruin it. We'll ruin our lives with just more money. But you see, God wants to grow us uh, in character. And he grows to understanding that it's, it's not just about more money. You no, know, it's about his blessings coming and us receiving and knowing it from him and then passing it through to others. That's, that's what he's that is designed to desire us to be. And so it's not about how much we give or how little we give. It's about what we're doing with what we have and honoring God with it. And that's what pleases him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to just in a small way dig into your word and just begin to unfold what it means to receive from you in a way that normally sometimes we don't talk about or think about. But the way you designed it and the way that I see your saints lived in, in Scripture that as they gave, they expected return they expected you to come and to bless them they expected you to prevent the pests from overtaking their crops they expected the, to have plenty to share with others they grew accustomed to that because they lived and walked and gave in faith and so lord i pray that you would lead us to that level i wasn't always at that place you know that i was probably in the somewhere in the compulsory and and responsibility giving for a long time 
until you begin to set me free to where I am today. And I've not arrived yet, Lord, you know that. So God, I pray that you would just help us to, to continue to um, grow in this understanding of how your blessings come to us and the avenues that they come so that we can have and walk in the fullness of what you want to bring. I'm convinced that, that we, don't, we don't have yet the fullness of Christ in our midst. If so, there would be no need. And so, Father, thank you for giving us a, a, just another chance to come back and, and, and recenter so that you can then pour out more, not just to us, but through us, to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Will you stand with me? Those scheduled to pray, would you come and join me up front? We'll give you opportunity. If you have anything on your heart, you need prayer for healing, you say, I don't, I don't know Jesus. I've heard about him. I'd like to start a relationship with him. Come, these people will, will uh, come and, and uh, help you get started, introduce you to Jesus, and let you uh, enter into a, a dynamic journey that's just amazing. But before we do that, I, I just want us to, to pray, if you're willing, just to pray and open up your heart to receive what God has for you in this message. Can we do that? Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, allowing us to open up the scripture maybe in a way that, that uh, uh, could be new or a refresher or, or just a, a place where we need to hear again. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would just, uh, each person listening, whether here in this place or online, I pray that they would receive exactly what you want to show them and give them, Lord. They would receive it in their heart, Father. And as they receive it in their heart, Lord, that they're then responsible to, to, to go forth and to put that into practice and see the results that you want to bring. And so, Lord, I, I bless those listening today with faith just to maybe try something new and see what the Lord might do. See what you might do, God. Risk a little bit. Maybe not much, but something. And say, God, I give you permission to help me risk but I want to step out in faith and honor you. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. You know, someone shared something that I haven't forgotten. And what's the difference between giving in the... How do you know when you're giving in faith? He said this, and I find it true. When you're giving in faith, your flesh wiggles. Your flesh sometimes tries to talk you out of it. Or the devil comes in and says, don't do that, that's stupid. It probably means that you've stepped into the level of faith. When your flesh is wiggling, saying, I don't know about that. Or the devil goes, stop it, you're crazy. But there's something inside of you that said, no, God showed me this. I'm going to step out and do it. Be quiet, flesh. Be quiet, devil. I'm moving in faith. 